Okay, the clock on the wall tells us that it is 2.15, and so being precise people, we will start promptly at 2.15. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Tom Johnson. I'm with the Institute for Analytic Journalism in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And my colleagues here are Carly Brousseau from The Oregonian and Andy Lyron from The New York Times. And we're going to talk today, obviously, about the data, but equally importantly, metadata and how we can use it. Um, what about some FOIA strategies that we all can use, making a, drawing a distinction between trying to get the data and trying to get the metadata. Uh, we're going to talk about whether one should apply a strategy of going for separate requests, that is, give me just the data, or giving me the metadata, or do we bundle those two objectives into one uh, request? pros and cons to both, but more importantly is that this is something which is unfolding as we speak. We, none of us, and I don't think anybody in the business has any definite answers about which strategy we should employ. And so what I hope we can do today is start to generate a discussion of sharing experience using these two strategies to see if there might be some best practices that we can all employ when we're trying to get the darn data and see if we can actually generate an action plan for doing this. So the metaphor that I started to use here is to say that this is data. Uh, you can do some things with it. You can count the incidents that we have here. You can categorize it as whole notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, etc. Um, you can, by counting all of the data and by looking at the categories, you can look at some proportions of the data. And in fact, you can literally measure the, the distance between these pieces of data. Uh, and it's helpful. And you could write stories on this basis, but you really need more information about what you can do with the data that you have. And that is you need to have the ecological system, the context in which that data exists. And so this would be the ecosystem for that data which we just saw. Uh, and with that, we can start to say, well, what can we do with this data? We can ask for a statement of rationale when we file a FOIA. Uh, we can put in the subject that we want, etc. We can also request a fee waiver, always a viable thing to do. But when we request the metadata, we want to ask for that code schema. We want to ask for the blank data collection forms. Uh, many of us have talked about that at this uh, session this weekend. Because with the blank forms, you can start to see the overall structure of what the agency is doing, excuse me. <coughs> um, we can ask for the description of the software that is used and the versions that are used to collect that data. Uh, oftentimes we run into uh, governmental agencies which either don't know very much about what they're doing with the software. They don't know how to, for example, take a spreadsheet and how you can redact panels or columns out of that spreadsheet and then save it as a separate file. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a aggressive, passive aggressiveness on their part or whether it's stupidity or maybe it's a matter of both. But we want to ask for that software. We also want to ask for some training manuals if we can get it to try to figure out whether or not people working for that agency have actually been trained to do more than just hit a couple keystrokes to follow a script and generate, God forbid, a PDF report. Um, and we, if we can, can get those things, we also want to ask about the emails related to training so we can get some feel for whether or not the agency is actually trying to take care of business and stay up to date with the software and the data that it is, is using. The problem is that we run into a lot of challenges with this. We find that laws will vary broadly over all kinds of jurisdictions. We find that there are exemptions uh, for everything, and I think you said that in Oregon, they, they keep the legislature keeps putting in more and more exemptions just by asking for it. So Carly can talk about that. Um, we often find that agencies are not required to produce new sets of data for us. Um, sometimes working papers or drafts will show up as exemptions, all of which could help us. 
And then perhaps um, most bothersome is that the governmental world still thinks in terms of PDFs. They think that somehow a PDF is a secure document that can't be manipulated. And if you've been to any of the sessions here this weekend, again, you know that uh, a quick search will find you a half a dozen programs which will allow you to uh, pull up and edit uh, various PDF forms. And then finally, I won't go to it in depth, but we can deal with the issue of data huggers. Uh, on one hand, it's good that we have people in public agencies who care about this data and they feel that they are the, the shepherds for this flock, but that can oftentimes present difficulties to us because they just don't want to give it to you. Um, we've seen all of those. So <clears throat> here's a recent story that is ongoing for me. I'm still working on it far from reaching a satisfactory conclusion. This has to do with what medications are being prescribed for prisoners in New Mexico prisons. We have prisons that are run by the government, we have prisons that are contract private operations, and we're just looking for patterns to see, for example, uh, will some uh, prisoners uh, or some people in the women's prisons in different women's prisons being or, uh, given different medications than they are in others and we don't care about who the prisoners are. What we're looking for is the medication. We're looking for the uh, who's writing those medications. Uh, we're looking to see what kind of companies are benefiting from those medications. And so when I file the, um, in New Mexico, the IPRA, the Inspection of Public Records Act request, I'm saying specifically, no, redact the prisoners' names. We don't care about that. Um, we don't care if they're in custody. We don't care what they're given. And this is what we got back from the state of New Mexico's Department of Corrections. 101 pages that look like this. The type is uh, at best four points uh, in size. It's impossible to read. And what they did was they generated a report. This looks like a spreadsheet, and I don't know if it came from a spreadsheet program or if they generated it out of a database. But they printed out a hard copy of the report and then the way they redacted the prisoners' names was just to take a strip of paper, lay it down into that column, and then scan it again. And so that re uh, results in, um, in an uh, image file, which you can't extract, and also they're, they're skewed on the pages, and uh, it's skewed and we're screwed. We can't, can't get at this data anymore. As I said, why are they doing this? Well, it might be incompetence on the part of the people in the Department of Corrections who don't know how to drive their spreadsheets, where you can just simply hide a column at least and, and generate a report that way. Or it might be passive aggressiveness. Uh, they're saying, well, it's, it's just another damn journalist coming down here and uh, let them deal with this. So <clears throat> what do we do next? Well, we can't get the data. Um, so we are saying, let's try to find out how that data report that we saw was produced and see if we can get under the hood a little bit on that. Um, how did they end up with this uh, PDF program? Um, and can a report be generated with the named person's field, in this case the prisoner, uh, redacted? Uh, of course it can. Um, Another example is in the city of Santa Fe, our police department runs its record keeping on a uh, IBM AS400. If you're following computer history, the AS400 was introduced probably before some of you were born. And the police department says, no, we can only produce PDF files from that on say, all crime reports. Well, about three minutes on Google, you can find, again, a half a dozen scripts that will tell you how you can use that machine and produce a perfectly fine spreadsheet or a set of uh, CSV data uh, from that machine. So it's this combination that we're working with of stupidity and um, reluctance on the part of the agency to let their data go. So we want to turn to then making this metadata request to see what's there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm asking for contracts. I'm asking for purchase orders. I'm asking for letters of understanding between the agency and any vendors that are out there. Now, I want to know about the training, again, that these people are getting. And I'm saying supply the documents describing or naming the digital files uh, used and saved. Because now then we can go back 
and ask for a specific file if we know it already exists. Um, with that, ask, if we can get this kind of metadata that I'm talking about, then we can possibly determine or at least argue in an appeal, hey, this is how you give us that data which you already have in an appropriate form. And as I've said, we want to look for training protocols as well about what the record keepers should know uh, given their training. And one way to get at that is to ask for emails related to the training so we can see not only who was there or who should have been there, but oftentimes if you can get at these emails, we'll have attachments. And so when you ask for emails, be sure to ask for the correspondence, but also any attachments that were in those emails. And sometimes you have to be very specific about that. And so then we go through and are asking for this variety of things about the database and the spreadsheet program. I'm not going to go into this in detail. You can pick it up from when I upload this to the tip sheets. Uh, I want to give my colleagues plenty of time here. But some high th highlights that you want, and Carly will talk about this, is that you want to get the code sheets for the particular database that you're looking at, the code schemas, <coughs> so that you can see what are the categories, for example, that are possible when it comes to the data entry into a field. Um, you want to ask for any flowcharts or instructions about how this process works. Uh, how do you get from who's collecting the data, how is it collected, who entered the data, who is vetting the data. Um, all of that information can give you insights into this much larger ecology for the system. So we get back, in this case, we have, have the PDFs of the spreadsheets, but they're, they're not useful. But we did get contracts for a company that used to be called the Corrections Corporation of America, and then it changed its name to Corazon Health, and now I think they've changed their name to <coughs> uh, something that m might be called, it's unclear, uh, MHM Services, or it might be called Core Civic. A lot of these companies will change their name um, when they're under threat or facing some uh, legal actions. In this case, uh, the contract didn't even spell the company's name correctly, but that's neither here nor there. So we're filing this stuff and we're going back then, not by not because we don't have the data, going back with a request and letting them know that we're prepared to go to court on this if we have to. Um, so uh, Carly is going to talk a little bit about some of her efforts in Oregon and what she's been doing at the local and the state level. So I am a data reporter at the Oregonian and I came to the Oregonian about two years ago from Arizona. So my experience with the public records laws in those two states is really what I'm drawing on. One thing I found pretty quickly upon landing in Oregon was that it was far harder to um, get data of any kind. <laughs> and so I'm kind of going to walk you through my discovery process uh, because I, I sort of started this new job where I had much less experience um, reporting a beat. I mean, that had been my experience in Arizona. I'd been a beat reporter and then moved to doing more data work. Um, so I already had pre-existing relationships. So I thought I would start with Portland Police Bureau, which is the main... Um, How do I go You can use this one or backwards? Um, no. Yes? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One more. There? Perfect. Yes. Okay. You're over here. Um, I thought I would start by asking uh, the Police Bureau for an inventory of its databases and, you know, general descriptive documents. So it was a pretty big request, but I sort of thought it would start a conversation. It did start a conversation. Not exactly the one that I hoped for. Um, so I asked for um, documents that describe the relationships between tables in the major databases, an inventory of databases, code tables, um, and a list of commonly produced reports. I had done this, I should say, after meeting with a public information officer who did data analysis for the Bureau, and so he knew this was coming. I did sort of try to uh, make a human contact before sending this in. Um, I did this in part because um, he struck me as not terribly competent and I wanted um, 
to know a little bit more about what I was working with. So, so they write back. They say, well, we can provide you this inventory, but we're not going to give you the fee waiver. So I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> that's a start. Uh, then um, when I, I sort of follow up asking about um, when that list is going to be available as time passes, I hear that, um, well, I ask for which statute they're relying on to deny me the rest of the request and suddenly we're meeting with the city attorney. Um, and in the meeting, um, it was an attorney who specializes in uh, intellectual property. And this kind of blew my mind because what they were really saying in this meeting was, this um, is these are trade secrets. We hire vendors to provide us these data services. They <coughs> say that the description of the fields and how tables are organized is part of their, um, you know, feeds into their profit and therefore it's a trade secret. And I just kind of couldn't believe that logic. Ultimately, I went and I spoke with the CEO of that company and he, he made basically that argument to me with <laughs> more force. I made the argument that there must be plenty of things that your software does that um, are far more impressive. I'm really just asking for the public information and, and how it is organized. I'm not asking about the speed or efficiency or um, technical details, the code that is actually the software. I'm simply asking for, you know, the fields and the, the available values. And um, he said no. <laughs> and the way that uh, the law works in Oregon is that basically it's the CEO's kind of prerogative. If the company tells the public agency it's a trade secret, they consider it a trade secret. Of course, we can sue at this point. We didn't in this case. Um, but it was really kind of a revelation to me. It also later, and I found this group, um, this might be instructive to other people here, I <laughs> was determined to learn more about this system. One of the things I did was start Googling a lot, as we probably all would, and um, I found that because they had formed a regional collaboration, several police agencies in the Portland area, the vast majority of them, participate in the same records management system, so they have public meetings with the um, with representatives of each of those agencies and they talk about various new codes of offense types that they want in this system, how reporting systems work, how the provision of public records from these systems work. I mean a lot of it is scheming how <laughs> not to provide public records from these systems. For example, in this case, agencies participating are in both Oregon and in Washington, and Washington's public records law is far um, friendlier. There are deadlines and there are caps on fees that neither exist in nearly so friendly a form in Oregon. So they were worried, reasonably, because I had this idea, um, that I was just going to go to the, or the Washington agencies and say, I want, you know, this, this report or this whatever from, from Portland, and I would have it for, you know, like $10 in five days which would never happen in a million years in Oregon. So they created a whole new round of legal agreements to try to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, I still think I can get around that and I plan to test it. But it, I, I'm saying that because they, as they have these, um, I think increasingly there will be this kind of collaboration, but that does create a new kind of avenue for inquiry for reporters, I think. So. Um, also part of that discovery process, I went um, and found the contract. Actually, I couldn't get the full contract because that cost $500. But um, this appendix that was available had the record layout, a pretty comprehensive record layout for the previous data system that Portland had designed. And so I knew that they wanted something essentially equivalent in this new system. So I used this as kind of a guide. Um, when I make requests now under the new system, and I'm kind of like reverse engineering the um, what I initially asked for. And in this case, this last piece is just the offense table. So eventually, I just get this sort of updated regularly because through these meetings, they create new um, offense types is how they're classified in the system. And tracking, for example, there's a settlement agreement with the DOJ in Portland um, that's related to how police handle people who are mentally ill. And so they actually have very useful and interesting um, offense types in the uh, data system that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. So 
that was that little odyssey. Around the same time, I had my discovery of the Oregon um, records that might be interesting to a data reporter focusing on criminal justice. I wanted to know what records um, the state certifying agency had on police officers. I figured they would have employment histories and training and um, know who was where, and they do. And I asked for the record layout, I talked to the IT guy, and I got what I thought was a pretty beautiful spreadsheet. The tabs along the bottom each represent a table in the relational database. You have like the fields, you have the data type, the number of characters, and I thought, awesome. <laughs> I made the request for the data. They quoted me $15,000. And um, a lot of it was for redaction time. They insisted that they had to have an attorney or maybe even more than one attorney review every field in the database because it was possible that a social security number could be anywhere. Um, so part of what was helpful about having this uh, original um, record layout was being able to argue, well, there aren't even enough characters in these fields for this. And we had this negotiation in front of the AG, and he agreed, obviously, that that was unreasonable logic. Um, but it really did uh, provide a lot of ammunition in those negotiations. So I guess I just want to highlight that use for metadata, uh, because that's been so much of my experience. Um, turns out that this record layout was fake. Um, <laughs> So despite my delight, <laughs> later in the negotiation, they were like, that's not the one we use. Um, so there was that later. Also in the AG's office, they provided this um, diagram of the tables and the relationships between them and the number of records in each table. Again, helpful in the negotiation, but wouldn't have been provided absent that. Um, at long last, I got, um, the data for one thousand um, dollars and it was a nice relational database that was um, redacted in a reasonable way and it was fairly clean data so it was kind of a success of the metadata request in this case um, I also looked into court data um, and this is an old and stained but like heavily loved um, <laughs> code book essentially for the um, Oregon court system data. So when I finally got here, I was like, somebody is pro and knows what they're doing. And um, of course they have much more sophisticated versions now, but I just like this, this one. So some of my takeaways from all this are to really think hard about the size and professionalism of the agency because th that matters, I think, in the sequence of your request. I don't think it's, I think there is a benefit to asking for a kind of metadata request early because it gives you leverage in the later um, conversations. You end up recreating the wheel less. But when you do that to a smaller agency and your request is so expansive, it just freaks them out. So I think it's worth thinking about doing things semi-incrementally, almost even as a kind of tickler as time goes on with other parts of your request. It reminds them that you're serious, that you know actually what you're talking about and that you're going to pursue this. So I don't think it's always the right answer, but asking for it first can be useful. Um, I like to go in person, partly because there's always more questions that come up. And um, another obstacle that I found with Portland police is that they, in some cases where I did get a, a record layout, they said, oh, well, it's copyrighted. That means you can see it, but we can't copy it. And I was really irritated at first, but it was a very helpful experience because then you had somebody who actually cared about the data and they were like captive in the room with you and they wouldn't have given me that otherwise. So I think <coughs> that's a good tool. Um, to the same point, I mean, there's always, there are always more questions no matter how well documented it is. Like each part of this gets you further along, but it doesn't solve everything. Um, I really, especially with smaller agencies, I had a lot of experience in Arizona asking for call data and specifically docu how calls to Border Patrol or Immigration and Customs Enforcement was recorded within their records management system. And many of them had very old records management systems and they couldn't, you know, export things other than um, as PDFs, but I would just kind of go back to them over and over and be like, I'm trying to make this easier for you. I'm trying to make this easier for you. And I think that really is something that they respond 
to, even if they are freaked out at first. And then lastly, um, legislators really should know about this. I think as journalists, we need to do a better job um, communicating that back because so many of these decisions, especially on this trade, uh, trade secrets point, I mean, it's about procurement decisions, right? I mean, they're kind of signing away um, information that we think is important. It's about understanding information that is clearly public, right? Created with public dollars in the public's name to do the public's business. And that's becoming harder and harder to get as, as through these contracts. Um, so um, in Oregon, where there are many, many exemptions and therefore the fees can be quite hefty with data requests, uh, my boss, Steve Suo, has come up with an idea that we offered as a legislative uh, concept this legislative session that he's calling Transparency by Design. And um, this really came out of that Portland Police Bureau experience. So these are kind of the four major points um, that they sort of, th this would be inserted into procurement law, which from our perspective seems like a good idea because it's altered with less frequency than the public records law in our state. It might not be the case everywhere, but it's one idea. And um, data can be exported in a non-proprietary open format. You don't end up with like a SAS file or um, another kind of file that's more difficult to manipulate in Oracle format. Um, the functionality should be built in and not require programming. You might be in a state that they, where they can charge you exorbitant fees for programming. That matters. Um, that the public body make it clear to the vendor that these are services that are required for them to buy the software. They should be able to redact. They should be able to export. And um, that the, the metadata about these, um, about the data stored in these systems is public record, not subject to these exemptions like trade secrets, copyright, any other version of kind of intellectual property ideas. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, so my name is Andy Leonard. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. Um, I've probably filed hundreds of FOIAs. I've, I know I've lost track of how many they've been. Um, and I think, you know, uh, both Tom and Carly have raised great points. I mean, uh, you know, f fighting for data can be very difficult. Um, in addition to fighting for the data, looking for things like contracts, like code books, like asking for the metadata, um, can be uh, can be really useful. Um, and that these fights can you know uh, can be difficult. Um, get the hang of this. So um, there's some other things too that I've found helpful. If I could just add to what what they've been saying. So first off, in some places. Um, like in North Carolina, you can get a database of databases. These can be incredibly helpful. Um, for a while, there used to be uh, a federal government uh, uh, list of every single database, ostensibly, that the government had. Um, uh, you can make other versions of that. So for instance, like you could use the Federal Register to go and find when they talk about different databases. Um, and that can give you also a clue of what's in there. Um, there are other things too. So like uh, um, uh, you can use, sometimes databases might be kept not just by an agency but by another agency in the same level of government, like at the local level. Um, so you could have like a, uh, an agency that handles mapping issues, GIS. So you can get the same data perhaps from the GIS people that you find very difficult getting from a police agency. Um, uh, getting um, old databases, and I think Carly kind of touched on it, can be helpful when you're negotiating for a new version of a database. Um, and, uh, and also we talked about forms, and I know forms have been talked about elsewhere. Um, I've also found lawsuits helpful, like if you can find lawsuits where that same information is somehow made it into the public sphere, um, and you're fighting for the data, um, going into the lawsuits can be a great way of uh, of learning what's in there. Um, also, when you talk about proprietary systems, one of the things that I've done is like if, if one state is difficult with proprietary issues, copyright issues, is to go find another state where that vendor does business 
And chances are they have the same kind of software, something that maybe collects ticketing or does ambulance reports or something like that. And say, well, well, gosh, you know, over here the public records law is a little bit better. Let me try to understand what's going on in this other state. And then I can go back to the state that's, that's proving difficult and saying, listen, I already know what's in there. It's public record in Rhode Island or wherever. Then you can go back to that state and press them and say, I don't understand how you could make a copyright argument because it's clearly public in this other state. Um, the other thing that I like to do um, a lot is I read reports. Um, and that's valuable too, particularly when you're having trouble getting a data set. You're, you're also trying to figure out in the back of your mind is this even going to be worth the effort? And if you can find a report, maybe it's a boring, dull academic report, you know, um, or you know, just something on JSTOR, uh, which is the great repository for academic reports, or uh, you know, maybe it's in a particular field like education or uh, justice issues, you just go to those, those kinds of libraries and see what kind of reports are there. It can even tell you whether like, the data is even being filled out. Because we also have the issue of like, you may have a, a form where it's ostensibly being collected, but is it really being collected? It's always nice to know if you can read like, oh, well, five years ago this academic wrote this report, and clearly that data is somehow in there. I just need to argue for it. The same thing, too, with reports. There could be uh, agency reports. Like every year an agency may have to present to city council justifying their existence. Well, this is what we do. This is what we do. We have a table here. Look at this table summarizing data. And you can say, ah, clues about what they have in their database. Or a city controller might have access to that database. So you can go get the city controller's report, or even better, talk to that independent agency, a city controller, the GAO on background, or an IG. And you can learn about what's in the database, even though that agency itself is not giving it to you. Um, looking at other places. Um, I also like to do, we did this a lot at NICAR when I was uh, running the database library there, is trying to follow the data trail. I still do it a lot. So the local agency is giving you a hard time, but maybe the, at the county level, all the local data is collected. Or maybe all the stuff at the county level is collected in a regional or state agency. So all the municipalities are giving you a hard time, but the state agency, it can be easier to get. Or you can get like a truncated version of the data perhaps at the federal level. Um, a great example is like uh, traffic accidents. Traffic accidents can be hard to get locally sometimes. Um, some states are great at it and get it to you quickly and have very robust data. Other states not so much. But the thing is uh, almost every tra traffic fatality in this country is reported to uh, the Department of Transportation. And so you might not get every accident like you would like, but you can get every fatality in the country, which can then help you with the state that you're having trouble with. So sometimes following the data trail can get you part of the way there. Uh, see if you can create your own version of the database. Um, doing data entry, um, creating some kind of form. Um, you know, We've done that as well. We've also done things where we've used uh, surveys to try to get at data that we believe is out there. Um, we've conducted surveys of you know, particular groups. Uh, we did this recently with a pretrial diversion story where we surveyed every uh, public defender in the country. Um, and so uh, that can be a useful way of getting at something that maybe you couldn't get at otherwise. Um, so uh, checking on time. I'm going to talk for maybe like another, I'll give you a couple quick examples now that we've gone like conceptual stuff. So. Um, so here's a story we did on uh, military hospitals. So these are not the VA hospitals, these are military hospitals. There's 55 of them around the world or so, um, 55 or so around the world. Um, and uh, these hospitals provide medical care to our soldiers, to their families, to anyone who's been in the military more than 20 years, um, and a few other small categories. Uh, services a population of about 10 million Americans. Does anyone want to guess what the most common thing these hospitals do is? Shout out an answer. What? Births. Births. Oh, God, it had to be Dan Keating, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who could probably be do doing this panel solo right now? It is. Uh, it's births. Some people think, oh, it's, you know, it's going to be uh, dealing with uh, injuries from wartime. Actually, the most common thing our military hospitals do is think about the demographic, young adults. And what do young adults do? So um, uh, it's among the things they do. They have a lot of babies. That's just demographically proven. This is not an opinion. Um, uh, 
they, they had a lot of births. Okay, so figure out, like, how do you manage a hospital, right? If you're managing 55 hospitals, and to put this another way, this is a tenth, this is a tenth of the Pentagon's budget, billions of dollars. One-tenth of the Pentagon's budget is devoted to providing health care under this program. Um, so uh, if you're running all these hospitals and you have this massive budget, how do you run a hospital? So we would call up the Pentagon and we'd say, we want all your data on how well you provide care, all your metrics. And they say, we don't keep that data. <laughs> we flat out don't keep that data. And you're like, you just back of your head, you're thinking, that's somewhere borderlining on irresponsible, if that's true, because how could you manage a gigantic health system and not know what's going on? That would be irresponsible. Or they're lying to us, which we clearly went with. So we then engaged in a FOIA fight that lasted more than a year, but we kept looking for all the breadcrumbs in reports, talking with sources, so that we knew that they had certain kinds of data. To go back to what Dan brought up, perinatal. So if you're running a hospital that delivers a lot of births, there's about four or five uh, agencies, private agencies in the country, that ostensibly grade how well you provide perinatal care. Why do you have this data? Every hospital administrator wants to know what they're doing right and doing wrong. You know, it's, it's the data you need to run a hospital. So we fought to get that data. Um, data they said, they said did not exist. The other big thing they do is surgeries, particularly routine surgeries, appendectomies, things like that. Um, so we fought for the data that they said that they could not provide. Um, we wanted to do something uh, a poor man's version of like the way you can look up hospitals online and you know provide a certain among the many things we want to do is first off find out the quality of care our soldiers and their families are getting to find out you know can soldiers look up their own hospital and you know have like some information like that um, so uh, so we uh, started, we kept digging and digging. It led to, uh, we were able to show how surgeries at military hospitals often go wrong. We were able to show uh, how, um, what was great about this kind of graded software, I mean these graded um, uh, uh, variables, is that you already have health experts who've like adjusted things for age and medical condition of people going in. So we're not doing it as the New York Times, although as, as much we would have loved to, but it's already essentially been crunched and blessed by experts. But we got that data that they said didn't exist. So we were able to say, look, these hospitals, you know, they were supposed to have like a surgical error rate of like 4% and that would have been standard in the industry. But guess what? These hospitals had an error rate, error rate of more than 6%. You know, I would find myself at the Pentagon talking with uh, the Army Surgeon General. Um, and saying like, well, what about, uh, what about Madigan Hospital? They have a really bad rate. And he literally was turning red and yelling at me saying, there's nothing wrong with Madigan. And a week later, the guy who runs Madigan was fired. Um, so, uh, you know, but again, we had to fight more than a year to get this data for that. But we were able to provide soldiers and, and all our readers, you know, a sense of where these hospitals are falling. The same thing holds true with, um, with, uh, um, the way they delivered babies at military hospitals. So uh, uh, one, of the, one of the indicators, these are all the fun things you learn when you do these stories. So like, again, I was under these stories very, often knowing very little. But uh, so uh, the same way Carly was talking about some of the police things. So we found out things like soldier, shoulder dystocia um, is a great indicator for how well babies are being delivered. That's where you're delivering the baby and the, and the shoulder essentially gets ripped out, you know, pulled out of place. Um, why is that a great indicator? Well, it turns out the military, because they're so tough, likes to have the babies, they, instead of doing a C-section as quickly as like a civilian hospital would, they would wait um, because the, the woman should just be able to get that baby out of there. But, Something like that. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the, the glib version of it, but you get the idea. They were waiting too long. So these babies were being born. They, were, they had a higher rate of, of babies dying, and they had a higher rate of other indicators like shoulder dystocia. They should have been going in there sooner to get the babies out, and it was harming babies' lives. That's actually kind of how we got onto this story, because we found a few lawsuits that dealt with this issue, and that's when we started fighting for the big data rather than just doing the anecdotal story based on off lawsuits. So soldiers can compare um, and go and check out their hospital. How much time? Is it time for questions? No, keep going. Okay. Uh, uh, 
Um, so uh, uh, I'll go over a, a one other recent story that we did. This had to do with, uh, I talked about it at the, uh, the noontime session, looking at, um, uh, it was police ticketing and looking at uh, uh, how police um, issue traffic tickets. Um, and uh, in particular, um, whether there's disparities in the way blacks and whites are treated. The short version of it is, is that in many places in the country that we were able to find, there are disparities. The way we look, measured disparities was not just like are blacks getting pulled over, because you get into all kinds of philosophical issues, well maybe the, the police will push back and say, well it's, we're not going after blacks, we're going after people are, who are involved in crime. So what we started focusing on is what's known in the criminal justice world, in the criminal justice world as the hit rate. What's the hit rate? The hit rate is looking at times when police have pulled over somebody, um, often not for a speeding ticket or something, have, but for a non-moving violation like a broken taillight. After they've pulled them over, do they then uh, search the car? And not search the car because they have a probable cause or a warrant for the search, but because they have what they call a Fourth Amendment search, which is like um, where the officer leans into the car and says, I'm going to search your car. You don't have a problem with that, do you? Um, and literally, that's uh, almost everyone agrees to what they call these consent searches. And, um, and so if you're, if you're treating blacks and whites evenly, the math should work out so that the hit rate, the times that you find guns and drugs when you do Fourth Amendment searches, should be roughly even for blacks and whites. And in some places, um, like Fayetteville, North Carolina, it is. But in many places, and we chose Greensboro, North Carolina, because it is typical, um, it is not even. Um, and blacks and whites get treated far differently when it comes to searches. Um, and, uh, and that we were able to document. So getting the data. Getting the data was very difficult in some places in the country. Um, some places it's super easy. Some places it's very hard. Getting the reports that the police departments put, put out, that was helpful because police departments often put out like, see, we're not profiling, we're not profiling. We would then use those reports to say, we want the data, we have this report, it tells us how your data works. Um, so uh, that was one thing uh, to do. Um, so, uh, and I've also done this at NBC where we did an hour long documentary doing the same thing. So I've, I've actually done several ticketing stories, but the data can be hard to get. In some cases, like in, um, uh, in Massachusetts for a while, it wasn't the, st the city police departments that would give you the data, it would be a state agency. Um, and in fact, when we were doing the, the New York Times story, uh, we looked at uh, millions of records and we got them from state agencies, all their communities throughout their state. Um, so again, it's kind of using the data trail. You can't, it's hard to get it locally, get it at the state level if you can. So I imagine we're probably time for questions now? Yeah, thank, thank you. Andy. Andy. Thank you, Andy. Um, let's start with Carly. Do you have a process in mind separating out between the data and the metadata about that you follow? Do you file separate requests? Do you file one bundled request? Do you have a time sequence where you will file for one, for say the data and then the metadata down the road? I think I'm still kind of experimenting. Uh, when I think it's going to be more limited, I will often ask for it together. If I'm kind of in a more exploratory uh, phase, I'll ask for the metadata first, um, in part because of the fee issue. That's interesting. So you find that they, they won't push back if you ask for the metadata financially? Um, it hasn't been as much of a financial issue. It's there have been really? other problems. Why? Do, why do you think that is? Uh, because they have other options that are, I mean, like the trade secrets thing. Uh huh. So, you can tell your editors, I'm going to save us some money by following this process. Start with the metadata, and and, and they they will more likely give it to us, or s at least some of it, than if we just go for the whole suitcase of data. Mm -hmm. And I think you you also, in some cases, earn some trust or respect from the agency because you can say, look, I'm really trying to like minimize the effort that you put into this and 
be responsible and understand the big picture, you can make those arguments, I think, with greater ease when you're showing that yeah. that's true. Excellent. Same question, which do you, do you have a yes, standard so operating procedure? So are, are lawyers generally like it if we file the, the full FOIA? But uh, we just had a, a, a series of s a package of stories we did recently called um, No Money, No Mercy, where we looked at pretrial diversion and we faced a difficult FOIA fight with, um, with one prosecutor in Alabama. And there we actually uh, broke apart our FOIA. Um, and it was, it was partly for money and it was partly for the speed of getting a response. Sometimes you have difficulties where agencies try to say, well, if you're filing separate FOIAs, we're going to track them and treat them as one FOIA, which is a you know, difficulty and you can argue against. So we were able to file our full FOIA, but in two separate FOIAs. And so one, went, one train went at one speed, the other train went at another speed, um, and we at least were able to get something. And at the same time you filed them. That's right. Put separate, like with the same requester, you, you being the guy asking for both of these things. Exactly. But we, had, we brought in a lawyer for that one. Yeah. That, was a, that was a difficult and expensive fight. And, and I've been told that some people will do that, but with two different individuals filing right. separately to confuse the agency, I, I don't know, and over time. So maybe you file for the data today, and two weeks from now you file for the metadata or vice versa. Um, as I say, we don't know. We don't know what the best way is on this. Dan, you've been doing this as long as any of us. Do you have a, have you evolved a strategy? The biggest one would be trying to see things they've already released. That's always my, lately that's always my first approach because I can't be the first person wandering in the door there. So I try to find what their history of stuff has been. And how do you do that? Uh, sometimes by asking them, sometimes by looking in the electronic FOIA reading room, because uh, they're supposed to put uh, things there that they released, and try to get some idea of what they do and don't release. Like I see a lot of agencies, most of their FOIAs seem to come from other agencies. And so that gives you an idea, because the other agencies know what they've got. And so it can really help you get a better idea. I mean, for the, for the metadata, a lot of times it's in what they've previously released. Interesting. So you can get at that. And, yeah. and, and, and note in the margin on that, one thing I've been pushing for a couple of years now is called open data, where by default government puts the data up there. And the first beneficiaries are not citizens and it's not journalists. The first people who benefit are people who work for government who suddenly can easily get at the data they need to do their job. And, and this is an example of it. Now, you're, you're in North Carolina. In D.C., all right. And the electronic reading rooms that you go to is in the government agencies, federal agencies. Yeah, I don't know how many states have, have the equivalent of that. Do you? I don't know where that is, but a handy thing. Does anybody else have uh, any experience of this, this bifurcation and what process you have used successfully or unsuccessfully? By the, by the way, so just to piggyback on one thing Dan was saying, you know, sometimes um, there are repositories of, of older data sets, um, like at the University of Michigan, there's a great repository of criminal justice data. Um, so you can find older version of your local, o older versions of your local data, sometimes warehoused there. Um, and that can be helpful. Do we, do we have any news researchers here who know the existence of, of the database of those kind of databases or repositories? I don't, I don't know of any offhand uh, that other than Michigan. Do you want to tell us about Denmark? About Denmark, yeah. Why not? You want to use, go to the microphone? Just so it's being recorded. Okay. Well, um, in Denmark we, we have a lot of problems. Uh, they made a new law. New public transport. I think I have to turn it on. I'm not a rock and roll singer. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Just go for it. <laughs> I don't think it's working. We'll repeat your question then for the audience. Yeah, uh, now it's working. Um, we have a new public records law, uh, which has, you know, tightened the way that we can get hands of, on data and metadata. So, uh, and, and it's quite, one of the things that we really are fighting with in Denmark is that they made this new law that you can go on and say it's a document that is concerned by you 
you know, the civil servants, they are um, helping the minister. And therefore, you cannot get it. And they used this uh, in connection with the, the Iraq war. I, I see a lot of documents and data on uh, the Iraq war. Uh, and they used it with, you know, uh, 18 or 15 years back in time. Hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they used a new law based Re new, new law to, to hold back. We would say retroactively. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the politicians, <coughs> they didn't really know that because even though they <laughs> you know, had made the law themselves. So what I did, I, I wrote a lot of stories about it, of course. And in the course of that, we, I also found, for instance, a data, secret database for um, with uh, a, you know a um, national archive for very super secret things that the historians didn't even know about and this was partly they said that they had put pic uh, documents about the Cold War in there about the Iraq war about the Afghanistan war but it was not up, up in the open so nobody knew about it it was only when they had this commission about Iraq and Afghanistan, and they closed it down, they got new government because the new government was the, the one that put us into war, and then they closed it down. And then I seek a lot of, uh, you know, Freedom of Information Act, and then this new archive came alive, and we didn't know it was there. So it's quite interesting to hear what you can do to to see how they think these civil servants when they do this because uh, I went aggress aggressively in and asked and new FOIAs and stuff like that and it came to light that some of the things <coughs> they had to turn over to the commission they didn't because they forgot it and, and stuff like this. So uh, we're facing a lot of <laughs> problems there. And I'm sure that there's a whole other topic for discussion about the relationship between laws in Denmark and the EU laws on these kinds of oh, issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it becomes even more complicated. So, uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, again, does anybody else have any experience of going after metadata? I, I like Carly's idea of starting with the metadata as an interesting approach, one that I certainly hadn't considered. Um, let's, let's see what the big picture is and then we can can narrow it down. And also, as, as Andy pointed out a few slides back here about following the, uh, following the trail, uh, we have to remember that everything that we see as federal data is actually usually an aggregate of some smaller government agency that fed it up. So you can follow this trail in both directions, starting local and seeing what's uploaded to the state, or you can reverse that process. Please. Yes, so I'm from Germany, and uh, there, when the police wants to do a, a database, they actually have to ask permission, uh, because you can't just nearly really uh, save data on citizens um, um, after uh, stuff that happened in Germany before. And so we have, uh, so the police has to go to the data protection commissioner and say, okay, we have this plan for this database, it looks like this, and we want to store this like this, and it's going to get deleted at this point, and stuff like that. And you can then actually go to the commissioner and uh, get this info, or you definitely know that this um, this document is at the police, and you can get it there. So it's basically they have a document that which describes the database, and no vendor or whatever can stop you from getting at this document. Getting at the content is uh, completely different, and that's uh, probably impossible in Germany. Right, uh, Germany and Canada to a certain degree are unique because Germany, for at least 20 years, I think, has had a privacy commissioner. And the presumption is is that data about you is under your control, unlike in the United States where we oftentimes think that the, the government has the data. And so um, it's, it's Germany is, is, I say, not quite unique, but very, very different philosophy than what we uh, have been working on. Thank you. I, um, I live in Vermont, and uh, one of the times that I tried to request the metadata in advance, um, I asked for, I think that I phrased it as a data dictionary, or a records layout, and uh, they came back and said, um, we don't know what a data dictionary is. And I said, well, okay, you know, <laughs> yeah. basically just a records layout. Um, whereupon they tried to convince me that they didn't have one. Um, which 
may or may not, you know, may or may not have been true. Um, so I'm wondering if there are, like, what what is in y'all's experience or anybody here? What are the different ways that you ask for it, different terminology, or ways that you describe it so that they can't sort of squirm out of it and say that that, that, that they don't have that? Um, that's my question, but then also I have had success just like hammering the PIO with so many detailed questions mm -hmm. that she finally got sick of me and finally just let me talk to the person in charge of the database. And she sat on the phone on a conference call with us for like 45 minutes until she was finally like, all right, I'm out. And hung up and just let me talk to the data person. And we actually like got somewhere and saved everybody a lot of time. Yeah, so that was great. But I, I would like to know just different strategies or different terminology to use so that people can't sort of squirm out of it like that. Suggestions? I usually take a very like descriptive um, tack, you know, you know, a record layout which, um, you know, might include, <laughs> like, I'm looking for the, the names of all of the fields in this database. I'm looking for the available values in this, those fields. So I just kind of lay it out, sometimes a, a paragraph, to try to um, cover the possibilities. Yeah. Even in your first request? Yeah, in yeah. the first yeah. request. If I use a, a word like that, because I've had the same kind of response. Yeah. We don't have that or we don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, I usually end up doing like my typical Columbo-like routine where like I'm calling, I usually call up before I'll file a FOIA and be like, S just one more question. I'm trying to understand. So like, when you're at the computer and you're like typing in this, you know, a police arrest or whatever. So like, how do you guys do it exactly? You know, so like, oh, so they're keying in. So like, how do you know like, like it's a murder, you know, or a, you know, that, oh, and, and like, what if, you, do you know the person? Oh, so you type in the name of the, uh, what about their race? Do you type the race? Or you got the race? You know, oh, okay. You know, and I just kind of walk them through it and, instead of, I don't even, often use the phrase, you know, data dictionary or code book, I try to understand their process and then, you know, maybe talk about manuals because the, the, the low level clerks maybe best understand the manuals. But to walk them through, um, and, and often I'm, I'm not totally stumbling, I might have read a report so I knew that they collect it either in their annual report to the city or you know, an academic report. So like I have an idea of what they're collecting and I'm just trying to really understand precisely, you know, yeah. And that gives it the value of getting the blank forms yeah. and seeing what's there. Or sometimes a screenshot. I mean, that's too difficult to ask for. But show me the screen where somebody enters the data. And if you're going to have race, well, is it going to be black? Is it going to be African American? Do you use the word Latino or do you use the word Hispanic? Do you, are Puerto Ricans, what are you going to, what are you going to do with that? So, yeah. but you, you hit on the thing is try to get to whoever actually handles the data. PIO people are, are not uh, computer science graduates. Actually, just reminded me, like, I remember one time I was fighting a FOIA with the FDA and they wouldn't tell me anything about the data, but they had this wonderful press release that had gone out a couple years earlier describing their brand new computer system to track the thing I was interested in. So I brought that up. I said, well, okay, now, and I, I don't know exactly what, what it looks like because you don't have the forms here and you're, you're fighting on that, but I know you have this database. And here's your press release describing this wonderful database. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, if you'd like to continue the conversation, I'd like to find a way where we can actually have a, a ongoing porch conversation about what's the best process here and you will be able to find this presentation I hope you can read it up there um, up online and we'll put it up with the tip sheets as well thank you very much thank you Tom thanks for organizing thank this. you no great job both of you thank you so much good. Carly it was a pleasure good. pleasure hearing you yeah great stuff it's fun yeah